Birmingham. It's day three of the Street Weapons Commission, and we're in a city where the lives of many have been blighted by territorial gang warfare. This year in Britain, more than one teenager every week has died on the streets in a gun or knife attack. Channel 4 has brought together a special commission on street weapons, chaired by Cherie Booth. Their task, to find out how we can turn back the tide of violence. Isn't it the police's job to stop people getting killed on the street? On her team tonight are Ian Levy, who set up the Through Unity Group to educate children about knife crime after his own son was killed in a stabbing four years ago. What are your views in relation to the availability of knives? Liam Black, a leading social entrepreneur. That doesn't sound very revolutionary. Teach them how to use computers. And criminologist Howard Williamson. You're concerned about kids getting excluded from school and then abandoned, forgotten about. The team is in Birmingham to find out the truth about street weapons. And we will reveal the details of a comprehensive new study undertaken for the Street Weapons Commission by the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies. Birmingham is no stranger to gang-related crime, particularly when it comes to guns. At the beginning of this century, we were plagued, obviously, by shootings, and most of them could be described as assassinations. At its peak in 2003, 27 people were murdered in gang-related gun crime in the Birmingham area. Most killings were gang-on-gang, gang, black on black, and didn't receive national coverage. It was on New Year's Eve 2003 that such incidents did come to national attention, with the drive-by shooting of innocent party goers Charlene Ellis and Letitia Shakespeare. The girls were gunned down in a hail of 30 bullets fired from three weapons, including a submachine gun. My daughter's life was cut short by this killing. This has got to end. Shocked by how gang violence appeared to be out of control, the police and community acted with a range of radical measures never seen in Britain before. It's now claimed the country is suffering from an epidemic of street violence, but in Birmingham, it appears the situation is improving. Though violent gangs do still exist, the West Midlands police estimate there are 400 gang members in the northwest of Birmingham alone. In March last year, 16-year-old Odwain Barnes, a member of a gang called the Bang Bang Crew, was stabbed to death in Birmingham city centre by three members of a rival gang. His loosely tied trainers had come off in the pursuit and the judge said today that his three killers were hunting him through the streets, their knives out. But this was one of just two gang murders in the whole of 2007, a massive drop from the 27 killings just four years before. So how has Birmingham done it? The commissioners wanted to know the true picture and whether this city could be a model for the whole country. The hearings were held here in Birmingham's town hall. Two commissioners have special connections with the city, Lord Geoffrey Deere as a former chief constable of West Midlands, and Mark Johnson, who grew up in Birmingham and lived here when he was a violent offender and a drug addict. Now fully rehabilitated, he works for the National Probation Service and the Prince's Trust. The first witness is Barbara Sawyers. Barbara's world shattered when her son Daniel was shot dead in 2003. Like Charlene Ellis and Letitia Shakespeare, he was an innocent victim of gang warfare. Barbara turned her grief into action by setting up Mothers in Pain. They support parents dealing with the fallout from gang violence and organize activities for kids trying to escape the streets. August coming, it'll be five years. And I can't really explain it. It's like I take day a day at a time. I mean, when my son died, I took the first six months I took off work, I had a letter come through the post from where I work 
um, I'm going into half pay. And it was as real to me as that. I mean, I was mourning and grieving for my son, but life still went on. Mm -hmm. I had to pay bills. I have two more children, and my life's changed completely because I'm very protective. I mean, so much so, me and my, my son will be 21 this, this year. We, we kind of like clash because if I hear a siren, I'm phoning yeah. him. Are You're you frightened right? for him. Yeah, and I'm not giving him a chance to live his life because I'm that frightened. And it really saddens me now that every, nearly every other day you read or you watch the television, it's still happening. And that just, I'm very saddened by that. It breaks my heart to know, well, whatever's happening, it's not enough, basically. Whatever the government are doing, it's not enough. It said that you argue that too many organisations and groups involved in tackling violent youth crime do not, in truth, really want to put an end to it because that would mean an end to their funding and their sense of self-importance. This is what I believe. That's it's quite my, a claim. This particular trust came up to me. I'm a vulnerable mother. I've lost my son. Oh, we can help to do this. That's all I wanted to hear because I wanted to make this difference. And all this person done was use my name on his application bid to get money. I never seen him again. You know, and this is, I know that for a fact, and this is what I'm saying. There's a lot of people, and I actually use the word, they're prostituting off, um, or pimping even, off my, people like my dead child. Well, when the government actually read a bid, it's ba I think that's the part they just stamp it because it looks nice. They need to send people out to these organisations or tr trusts or wherever they give their money to, and they need to say, I need to see the success. I want to see the bodies behind these names, and I want them to give a testimony and say to me, how has this organisation changed my, um, their life? And what does Mothers in Pain do? Well, what we do, we came about, it's not just myself, it's another mother named Thelma Perkins. And we just got together because we realised there was nothing out there for mm -hmm. us. There was not, no offence to the police. In my case, the police done an excellent job. They caught the criminals and they're now behind bars. Um, but there was other families who the police weren't so supportive to them. So we just set up this organisation on the back end of that. Like We support parents who've got to go to court with their children or problems at school. And we also have a Saturday class that we take in children, teach them to cook, creative stuff, and one-to-one -one sessions, group sessions on, not so much mentoring, but we talk to them to try and show them the life of the gun and the knife is not the way. You know, we try to build, I don't know, I suppose boost them up and give them some kind of self-worth. A lot of people are <coughs> telling us that it's got to start with education and uh, you, the paperwork we've got uh, from you tells us that uh, you're concerned about kids getting excluded from school and then abandoned, forgotten about. Well, the thing is, there's, there's, all this, there's all these titles out there. When these kids are excluded from school, there's all these places where they're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact these children, they're not forced to go there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got a mother who's had four children, and bar one of her children, they've all left, they've all been thrown out of school at the age of 10. And she had no aftercare, nothing. And it's not because she hasn't hunted for it. She says, everywhere I go, Barbara, no one cares. She's done all the so-called channels where she's supposed to go down the avenues. Nobody cares. And it's only when the kids get into the system of, like, prison system, is that is when people want to care for them. It's too late. Well, I think, Barbara, okay. you okay. yourself going into, as you do, and, and you talk about these things, mm -hmm. are you able to make a connection with some of these kids, at least? Well, the, yeah, we had a, child, a, a young man the other day. He was on an ASBO, and we took him in under our wing as Mothers in Pain. He's now doing three days a week um, on a, as a mentoring young people in the schools. And he was, like, basically given up to say, well, he's finished. And he's we, just a bad boy. Yeah, well, that's what he was labelled as. Mm -hmm. But you just... And sometimes it's just having the time to talk and the right people to talk to these people. You need people of the same community or the same understanding to understand. And like people like us, we live in the problem every day and we know what the problems are. We probably can't solve them without help, but we can try and get in there at least rather well, than just give them up. Thank you, Barbara Sawyers, for coming and, and, and sharing that with us. In part two... The Street Weapons Commission hears how the West Midlands Police have introduced some radical changes, changes they claim have brought about a dramatic drop in violent crime. And 
What is the reality of life on the streets for Birmingham's youth? In Birmingham, many believe kids are motivated to join gangs in search of the three R's. Respect, revenge and revenue. All three feed into every conflict. Within this, gangs are highly territorial and carve out their boundaries by postcode. Those who dare cross into rival areas must be prepared to face the consequences. Derek Campbell is an advisor to the Home Office and able to map some of the gang territoriality that so blights everyone's lives. Well, this is just a typical example of how gangs have segmented themselves geographically. The local gangs are using postcode markings to stake out their territory, just like a, a, an animal in the wild that would use scent to sort of stake out the boundaries to make people aware that this is the area in which they operate. The police claim to have seriously reduced gang violence, but these young people tell a different story. For them, conflict and a brutal culture of territoriality are a way of life. If people don't know you're around the area, anything can happen to you. I think it's best when you don't know people, because for me personally, I know a lot of people, and like, I find that people that know people get into more trouble. Yeah, you don't really boys have to do that though, really? I know. Just boys have to do that. Yeah, but... I used to go to school out of my area, innit? And, um, they, because, because the first day I went to the school, I had problems, innit? Because that, that school was con like, connected with a certain gang, innit? Even if you're not in the gang thing, like, people want to associate you with it because you're from that area, innit? When you're in a gang now, you have to show that you're loyal to other gangs and you have to do what they're doing. Mm. See if you're not walking in the same footsteps that your gang's walking in.
you'll get you'll get kicked out of the gang basically and then that gang will switch on you if you don't belong to something that means you can get beat up from both gangs so you need to belong to something these are not isolated opinions i have been um assaulted with a knife that was just some kid trying to start a fight and trying to mug me he pulled out a knife i turned to run and he lunged at my leg it used to be gangs, 21-year-olds, 27-year-olds. Now you'll see 15-year-olds, even 12, 13-year-olds threatening each other. It's quite disturbing when you see a year seven child, a year, a year you know, an 11-year-old girl with a knife in a little handbag. I think if things appeared more tough on if things were knife violence, they wouldn't be so relaxed about it. I mean, no one worries about stabbing someone else because you get away with it. The police don't have a grip on the situation. If they did, I wouldn't have friends right now with knives at the tender age of 13. I wouldn't have been threatened with knives. My friend here wouldn't have been stabbed. But the West Midlands police believe that by tackling Birmingham's culture of violence head on, they have seriously stemmed gang violence. Certainly the figures show a massive fall in street crime a fact the police attribute to some innovative approaches. Former detective Kirk Dawes set up the UK's first ever gang mediation project. Working with Kirk is head of Birmingham's anti-gang partnership, Chief Superintendent Tom Coughlin. Can you tell us a little bit about your methods. At the beginning of this century we were plagued obviously by shootings. Some of them were in the middle of the day in town centres and the like and most of them could be described as assassinations in the middle of the day in Birmingham. It was spiralling out of control and indeed West Midlands Police were responsible for its enforcement and the like but we felt that um, one of the things that hadn't been considered is how we actually deal with the individuals and the individual conflicts how we might slow those down and hopefully one day work towards a resolution in terms of the behaviours that the, were out there. But doing the work for the West Midlands kept leading us back towards Northern Ireland. And in Northern Ireland, what we actually saw was the use of dialogue. In other words, how do you get warring peoples to sit down and talk about their differences without using extreme violence? We saw in Northern Ireland that, um, and you know, look, looking at what was then going into the Good Friday Agreement, whereby it was something that had never been tried in England and certainly not something that was being done here around criminality. We've heard about this sort of three hours, this whole idea, you know, nowadays a lot of the stuff around guns seems to be about revenge, it seems to be about using a gun to get respect. What's mediation got to do with any of that? We would find that uh, where you've had a discharge of a firearm or a killing, normally the first shot that goes off in a conflict isn't designed to kill, but to tell somebody that if you do this, this is what I can do. What we found out in the revenge was that was the death. The in-between part in that was who was going to go out there and engage these people to actually deal with it together. In other words, let's talk to each other, let's create a better understanding and let's truly find out what the real conflict is. Well, let me just ask Tom briefly. Tom, what's the police attitude to this? Do you feel this has worked? Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly a leap of faith for, uh, for a public agency to, to, to work in this way and, uh, and trust the experts, the mediation service, to actually work in the community and, and, and try and prevent that conflict resulting in a serious injury or death to someone and um, uh, and that's exactly what they do they take referrals from within the police service themselves they will take most of their referrals from the community themselves and their job is to stop people getting killed on the streets now the methods they would do that are you know but isn't, as it, isn't it the police's job to stop people getting killed on the streets yes but wh where where we have an opportunity to um to um receive reports receive information re receive complaints and investigate that and stop and get stop people getting killed but the, the reality is that in 2002 before we had the mediation service there was there was 27 gang related murders in birmingham last year there was two and the previous year there was two. 
Right. So you're identifying the people most likely to, to, to be engaged in this, and then you're engaging in continuous dialogue with them, not simply only speaking to them when something's gone wrong. Is that, is that basically what we're talking about? Yes, I think, I think the work, you know, Kirk's team and, and mediation service, it's a mediation and transformation service. Mm -hmm. So it, it is very much involved in not only resolving that conflict, but trying to encourage those that want to exit the gang lifestyle and provide a pathway of support and, and, and recognition and help from the public agencies to actually allow them to do that. Oftentimes there's, there, there are situations where um, people want to leave a gang, but a gang uh, isn't happy for them to leave. I'm just interested in how or what, what sort of services you've got available or how you go about facilitating that and, and what moves are necessary to, to make that happen. When you speak to most of the youngsters that are involved in this, most of them do not want to be a member of that gang that does the level of violence that they do because they know one day it will be them. It's about taking them out of their uh, mind and into a reality because some of them don't see what is possible. By engaging them, um, what used to be for them, coming out on licence, would be a visit to a probation officer once a week that would be it for maybe an hour if that if that long it might be five minutes within the system that we operate here is this they have a mediator for the conflict they have a member of a mentoring team they will have the uh, police offender manager and they will have the probation officer with any given um, sort of week two week period they'll be seen probably three or four times that way we build a relationship then whereby they contact us when they've got any problems whatsoever so that it can be dealt with in real time rather than uh, leaving it to fester as it were. Um, so who, who are your mediators? What's the profile of the mediators that go in to do the work? The mediators can actually come from anywhere but they, they mainly come from the community. We've got a forensic psychologist for instance all the way through to somebody who was involved you know some years ago in gangs themselves. In between, there are people who are firemen, youth offending workers, probation officers, um, mothers who have lost their children, mothers who have had children shot. So there's a wide range. So what's the, what's the sort of, what's your experience with the willingness of people wanting to take part in it? When your life's in danger, people will take help from virtually anywhere. What I would say to you, most of the referrals come from the community. They come from the people who are involved themselves and likely to die. Some of those who would exist within prisons, who make phone calls uh, to relatives or even directly to us, when they know after a long period of uh, imprisonment they're coming out to a conflict, that just because they were sentenced, that didn't resolve it, but it needed resolving before they came back out. I don't know quite how you, you, you draw out your own impact from all the other factors that are in play. Because you, you said yourself here that it's your words impossible to tease out the impact of the scheme now what i would say in terms of trying to judge the impact from a from a, from a policing perspective is that, that that we're very clear in birmingham it's not a single enforcement approach that that's that's found in the criminal justice system and that that risk removal and punitive action is the sole um, um, method of actually reducing this problem. It's about prevention, it's about rehabilitation, it's about resettlement, it's about appropriate use of enforcement and um, it's difficult to, to say which one of those particular interventions is making the most impact but what I can say clearly in Birmingham is a combination of that approach has made a significant impact to, to death, serious harm and, and safety in the community. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Kirk Dawes and Tom Coughlin. Thank you. In August last year, West Midlands Police adopted another unorthodox approach to tackling gangs. Often, the police thought they knew who the perpetrators of gang violence were, but were unable to prosecute because witnesses were afraid to come forward. So, rather than use the criminal courts exclusively to tackle the issue, the police turned to civil courts where the burden of proof is much lower. It has proved highly controversial. 
Working in a similar way to ASBOs, they got injunctions which allowed the police to restrict the movements of certain key individuals. These are the uh, uh, offenders that have a propensity towards dealing in gangs and guns, um, but we hadn't got the ability to deal with them criminally because we hadn't got the evidence available. It was called Operation Malva. The Commission wanted to know how it worked. Assistant Chief Constable Suzette Davenport runs Birmingham's anti-gang partnership set up in the wake of the murders of Charlie Nellis and Letitia Shakespeare. So what things are you actually doing and what's working and what isn't working? We have very successfully in the last 12 months uh, worked an initiative which we've termed Operation Malva. And this is about uh, identifying the most risky individuals in our, our communities and from that, putting them into a particular group of people who then determine how we can achieve a level of control over them. And how do you achieve a level of control? We've done that through using uh, antisocial behaviour orders, civil injunctions, um, Section 222 of the Local Government Act, in order that we could get control by saying that through interim injunctions and then applying for full orders that they couldn't associate with particular people or go in, in particular areas. And uh, our figures will show us that having been very successful at the beginning of the year between May and August when we first started the programme, there were a significant number of uh, gang-related shootings, we believe. We reduced those by a significant amount between August and January. So you're telling us that you that the strategy you adopted worked in that it, the numbers went down? Yes, we, we have a whole range of tactics that we use. Um, stop and search is one of those. So we have generic things that we can do in the communities and then we also have a range of specific things we can do about individuals. We know that the drugs trade uh, is behind uh, much of the crime. Uh, I'd like to know sort of some of the things that you're doing to combat that in the area. Certainly if you look at the history of some of the, the gang issues in Birmingham, um, 1999, 2000, then that was very largely around uh, drugs uh, in particular communities. I have to say that today the issues are less about, less driven uh, in relation to drugs. It is more about we, what we describe as the three R's, which is about uh, respect, it's about revenge and it's about reward. So there might be some small part of that that is about drugs, but certainly my experience of being here is that that is not the driver. It is as much about identity and respect uh, and revenge as it is about anything else like drugs. Suzette Davenport, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Whilst police initiatives mean violent crime has plummeted, the issue still has a big impact on the local community. Low Cells is one of the most deprived areas in Birmingham. The area is still scarred from bitter race riots in 2005. Many shops were looted in the conflict, which left two people dead, four in prison, and the whole area in turmoil. Gang violence in Low Cells is still making local headlines. Our commission wanted to find out what impact this was having on local business. High crime rates are pushing up the price of insurance, threatening to put some local traders out of business. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So before I paid them, then it was like 900 for that, for a year. And now I pay 1600. Wow. What, for, for insurance? Yeah, for insurance. 900 to 1600. 1600. That's a lot of chips. And with customers fearing attack on the streets, many local shops are struggling. The effect on the trade of this Young people are like, you know, youths attacking the other people that nobody's willing to come to the shop in the evening. I mean, after 7 o'clock, you know, in sunset, you know, people are actually afraid to come out the houses to come to the shop because they might get robbed or something. For some, like grocer Mohammed Jangir, the violence doesn't stop at the shop door. The chap actually walked into the, my premises and he was actually with a machete and he actually attacked me with it. I've actually put my hand out to protect myself and uh, as I did that, it hit my hand actually, it was split into two pieces and next thing I realised I was myself, I was trying to get away from there and I took another shot at the back of my neck, I had a chain basically, that's actually saved me. The head of the local trade association, Fazal Kapazi, believes the authorities have quite simply abandoned those elves. 
this area is is now classed as the dustbin of Birmingham. They can't get rid of the, the, the drugs and the crime, so why not contain it in one area? After the break, the Commission wants to hear from the community groups. What are they doing to reach out to these kids? They hear from a former gangster who uses love to reach the kids and from a middle-aged mother who tours the country shocking young children with horrific pictures of knife crime. Birmingham's community has many views on how to end the violence, but they share a common goal, to break up the youth gangs. But what would the youngsters themselves do? If you get governments involved, they'll just make it worse. If I had the money, every gang, I'd give them 10 mil to split throughout, throughout everyone. And if, everyone, if everyone's got money and, and no one's poor no more, and no one's living in poverty, it will stop. I don't Yeah, because they're all by the They're still not going to gonna speak to the opposite side. I don't think so. so. I don't think. I can't imagine anything that it would like that you could give to the gangs to make them stop. You see, what happens is when people make enough money, they leave the gang stuff. Mm. When people make enough money, you don't see them no more. You don't see yeah, them at ends no the more. Grow. People are rapping for different reasons, so Some people shout, some, some people. Just people Want to make music? It's like everyone's different. If I was the government, yeah, I'd open as many youth clubs as possible around every area, just just to show show them something to do. Like, I reckon less violence happen if that was that was the yeah, case. Less. Not really, because if they saw other people from gangs like at their youth clubs and they want to like fight them in there, because like, they're that's, in their territory. Yeah, some people just want to go out and there just create violence and some people want to change because I've spoke to people that say I want to go to church, I want to change and that but I just don't know how to leave it, I'm t in too nobody. deep. Could you just imagine it though, to have the honest no. truth, just like being able to go to a party with everyone from every area. So oh my god, it was so yes, no, me. Trust me. no knives, no beef, no nothing, it would just be the best. That would be Yeah, sick. but just imagine just one day with it. The next witness, Anne Oakes Odger, is a mother on a personal crusade. For the past two years, she's toured the nation's schools, showing children as young as 11 graphic pictures of knife injuries. Now you actually go into the schools and you target year seven pupils in particular, 
and you try and speak to them in their language, if I can put it that way. We go into the schools um, and show the young um, year sevens in particular what can happen if they carry a weapon in the foolish belief that it will protect them. And when you show young people graphic photographs of fingers hanging off and other um, injuries um, inflicted by their own um, knife, they do tend to take stock. These are some of the images Anne shows the children. She believes it is the only way to get her message through. So am I right in thinking that it's uh, an information giving sort of project or do you actually engage sort of one on one with individual uh, children? Well last year I linked in with the Safer Schools officer and went and gave talks to the children there on the basis of assemblies. I took pictures of Wesley growing up and focused on Wesley at their age. So Wesley was a real person to them. Anne's teenage son Wesley, an innocent victim of a knife attack, was stabbed to death in 2005. By the time I um, explained to them what actually happened to Wesley, not only was the information about the loss of Wesley and the knock-on effect to us as a family, but also I gave them something else to think about, which is the perpetrators and the knock-on effect within their family and their community and, and what actually happens um, when somebody goes to prison. So, you know, there's more than one aspect um, to the information that, that they're given. What are your views um, in relation to the availability of knives? Uh, obviously, if, the, if these kids are getting knives or are having knives, it, it must come from some source. We cannot say, well, we're, go we're going to ban knives because we eat our food with knives. This is the important message that we need to get across to young people, and that is at what point does that become the lethal weapon that, that a knife is? And the answer is as soon as they take that from the front door. Are you suggesting or advocating that there should also be a mandatory sentence for carrying a knife instead of a maximum sentence? What I would say is that whatever um, uh, laws that we have in place should be seen as a clear message of deterrent by those um, sentences being enforced when a person um, you know, is caught. Um, the one thing that I find a good thing is the response I've received from 11 and 12 year olds when they realize that I am a mother who is telling a real story about my son's life having been taken and they see the pictures of him wearing a school uniform the same as they are. Um, they, you can hear a pin drop, they do take that on board but those that persistently decide to have a criminal mentality and a, a recidivist attitude towards um, society must pay the penalty and seen to pay that penalty. Um, um, thanks, Roger. Thank you. Thank you. Anne's project has a two-year lead on the Home Office, which has recently launched a national anti-knife campaign. As the blade enters the body, it tears apart the tissue structure. Young people helped develop the government campaign, which shows graphic images of knife crime in a series of posters and TV and radio ads. But the message is the same as Anne's. If you carry a knife, you're more likely to get stabbed. Although recorded crime levels show knife attacks have stayed the same for 10 years, most anecdotal evidence suggests it's out of control. What we do know is victims and attackers are getting steadily younger.
in 1996, only 114 under-18s were charged across Britain with knife offences. In 2006, this had jumped to 1,226. One way to reduce such figures is to discourage kids from joining gangs in the first place. For former gangster Chris Liu and Mike Royal of Christian organization The Street Pastors, engagement is the key. They go out onto the city streets to talk to the gangs face to face in an attempt to persuade them that violence is not the way to live. You were a gang member yourself in, involved in uh, not just low level crime but quite serious crime. Yes. And were you, how, what age were you when you got involved? The age of about 19. These days it's much younger than yeah, that. Yeah, I'd say from 15 upwards. Many of the junior members of gangs are put under, and, and the quote is, terrifying pressure to carry out tasks. Um, and, and they're very scared to do that, but they do it because it's part of the gang culture. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about that? There is lads out there, the main dealers, they sometimes are short of foot soldiers. Yeah. So they will put pressure on someone to do their dirty work. Which is running errands? Yes. W would it be uh, telling them to go and commit a violent act in order to prove themselves? Yes, that happens in some Does gangs. It? Yes. What sort of violent act? Uh, right up to murder. Just go out and, 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 sla and, and stab somebody or slash somebody just from to prove that you can do it? From a different gang. As serious as that? Yes. I can understand postcode gangs, they tend to be very much the locality. People are drawn into it because they live there and they need to join because otherwise they're outcasts and, and, and they're at risk. Does it automatically follow that they will then involve themselves in crime like drug dealing or protection racketing or whatever else? Or are some of those gangs just there to protect their turf? Some of them are just there to protect themselves, really. I mean, there's a lot of them who don't want to be involved, don't want to be with gangs, but if they segregate themselves and, and be, walk to the city centre on their own, then they're vulnerable and they can get hurt. So what do they do? Go back to the, the company they know where they feel protected and safe. Mm. Mike, how do you um, get that change in mindset to try to turn a young person around from selling drugs on the street, earning two thousand pounds a week, to then t saying to him, "You need to work in that shop for for two hundred quid a week." Mm -hmm. I think the reality is you you, you need to, to 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 cause them to face the fact that they may be earning that now, but they will either be in prison or dead tomorrow, um, and and the average um, length of time on the street isn't very long. Um, I, I think that it's about lifting their aspirations and causing them to realise that, um, that, that if they actually go again and have an, a, a go at their education and, 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 and a career opportunity, then actually there is a possibility um, that they could make something positive of themselves through that avenue. How many people do you think that it excludes because of the face budget? One of our values is the sanctity of human life. And um, I think that what, what you're doing is giving people yourselves. Um, and you're giving them love. It's a word that's missing from service delivery. And so we're not knocking them over the head with a Bible or any other religious book. We're actually giving them ourselves. Um, and, um, and I think people appreciate that. Thank you both. Mark Edwards runs the Young Disciples Youth Centre. The project provides gang members with high-tech computers and a state-of-the-art music studio. Some would say this is simply rewarding bad behaviour, but as a former gangster himself, Mark believes that to keep kids off the streets and away from crime, you have to give them something else to do. I started Young Disciples about eight years ago. At that time, there was so much things happening around young people getting shot, and there was lots of 
um, young people going astray and stuff. I felt like we needed a project to kind of divert them away from that lifestyle. And I didn't think that there was anything at that time around. The agencies didn't really know how to engage those types of hardcore youngsters. So uh, we set up Young Disciples as a user-friendly project for young people from the inner city areas. We employed local people from the locality which had some type of connection with the young people in the area and also as well which could empathise with the young people. Yes, you are, it starts! Yeah. Mark Edwards gave formal evidence to the Street Weapons Commission. So how can you engage with these young people when other services are failing? Well, <laughs> I have experienced a lot of the issues which the young people in the inner city areas face. Um, and, and so is it boys like you that you're engaging with? Or like you were? <laughs> Yes, I would say that. And I would say that that is one of the solutions. I don't know if you've heard of this metaphor before, but if somebody has a snake bite, they actually use the same venom mm. to create an antidote. And I believe that if somebody has come from a criminal background or from a disaffected past, if they've been transformed or if they've gone through a process, which I have done, um, that they can be utilised to work back with the same client group where they're coming from. One of your big um, views on resolving violent youth crime is, is, is about providing non-academic children with a meaningful experience. Could you be as specific as you can about what that more tailored curriculum for individuals would look like? Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, at the moment we want a, a social inclusion programme through music. Some of the young people we're working with have learning difficulties, slightly dyslexic, slightly autistic. So their learning style is quite different to the general masses. Now, what we do now through our music program, we introduce them to computers, so they become computer literate. In a school setting, they're quite um, frightened of that setting to go behind a computer. But because they, they, they learn in a more audio and, 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 and a pictorial way, We've managed to design programs around that where they can still learn. That doesn't sound very revolutionary. Teach them how to use computers and... What, what will be different? I mean, that goes on in schools. It's not something which is extraordinary what we're doing. We work alongside the schools, alongside the curriculum, but we approach it from a different way. Um, we do have a lot of outreach programs which is very effective in the schools, and some of the outputs of those programs is that young persons who have been excluded have been reintegrated back into school and they haven't had no other problems from them. And since that, we've now got a contract with the school and, and the success at the moment is 100%. So I think that, you know, programs like that should be resourced, should be highlighted as good practice and rolled out in other localities. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'd like to know from your projects that you run, um, what sort of progression route have you got for any of the young people who you engage with? So, for example, you know, you, you've come into contact with a young person. You've brought him in under your discipleship, if you like, and you've done all that you can for him. What is the next step for that young person? Okay, can I speak of an individual that I've previously worked with and use that as a case study? Yes. A young person who I was working with came out of prison um, he was inside for over five years, came out and the transition from prison through university now into a job. That's the type of progression that I'm dealing with personally. Well, Mark Edwards, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. The papers tell us we're in the middle of a street crime epidemic. But the headline statistics hide a far more complicated picture. Are Britain's streets really getting more violent? After the break, the Street Weapons Commission will hear from Britain's leading policeman in charge of violent crime to see if he can shed some light on the truth behind the numbers.
so far, Birmingham has provided the Street Weapons Commission with valuable insight into how, in addition to traditional policing methods, the city is fighting gangs, gun and knife crime. The West Midlands Police have adopted the use of civil injunctions and a radical gang mediation service to cut street crime. But the Commission has also heard contradictory evidence from the streets. So what's the reality, not just for Birmingham, but for the whole of Britain? The headlines tell us that we're immersed in an epidemic of street crime. At the same time, violent crime statistics appear to be going down. Keith Bristow speaks for police forces across the country for the Association of Chief Police Officers. So from your perspective, how would you ex assess the extent of youth crime, youth violent crime in Britain today? What the statistics tell us is that um, in general terms, both British Crime Survey and Recorded Crime, we're making real progress. Um, after a significant rise in violent crime since 1997, we start to see some of that top off and we actually start to see some reductions now in gun crime. But I think the really big debate is about what people see outside their front doors, whether that's perception or reality. And so what are you finding at the moment? The experience doesn't match the reality? An issue that concerns me is that um, if you look at gun crime, for instance, we're seeing some pretty significant over the last few years drops in recorded gun crime. But I do think there's a whole range of activities involving guns and violence that people aren't reporting to us. And I think that's a very real problem. As what, a, what sort of things would they be then? Well, I think it tends to be less about people actually being seriously hurt or killed as a result of, for instance, gun crime, and more about guns being shown or people being aware of shots being discharged. And I think it's really important that all of us stand up and say, we need people to tell us what's going on. We need people to tell us who's doing that to give us the best opportunity to do something about it. We get the, the impression that there's, there are more guns and indeed knives around. Would that uh, accord with your view? Uh, I think in general terms, yes. But I think uh, the number of these things that are available is one dynamic in the sense that guns are passed between different groups. And I think young people in particular who have the right contacts within the communities where they live or more properly the wrong contacts are not likely to have difficulty in getting hold of weapons if that's what they want to do. In very simplistic terms, there, there, there are two faces to policing. There, there's, a, there's a hard face and a soft face. The soft face is what you've been talking about. So let's, let's go to the hard end and just talk about that for a moment. I wouldn't want you to misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not proposing that policing, in, in, in the language that you've used, goes soft. I'm proposing quite the opposite. I think any of the tactics that we can adopt which manages some of that risk, including screening, including use of stop and search, including arresting people, including entering their homes and recovering violent material which may be relevant to their behaviour, doing all of those robust things are crucial. And that for me is about managing risky people. But also there's victims. We're the front end of dealing with victims as well. And so you can't sort of disengage all of this and imagine, that, in my view, there's one set of hard policing over here and some soft policing. It's a, it's a coherent, sensitive, well thought through approach which ranges from sensitive caring for victims through to robust enforcement which often requires police officers to use force. And we are the only people that can do that and we need to do it well. I'm not suggesting any sort of tiptoeing around the issue or being soft on this. Sometimes it's about being very, very robust, but it's got to be well directed. And how do we deal with the guns that are in circulation at the moment? We need the communities to have the confidence to talk to us about where the guns are and who's using them and where the ammunition is. Without that sort of intelligence and information, and a lot of that is about confidence in policing and the criminal justice process, we can't make progress. I think if we focus on making that real difference, rather than constantly focusing on metrics and lines in, on graphs, for instance, we might be better off measuring the level of violence within our communities by looking at the number of people who present to hospitals in A&E departments with injuries rather than focusing on recorded crime. So would it be a good idea, for example, for ACPO to approach uh, the various Royal Colleges or the BMA and see whether there could be an agreement about sharing some more of this information? It would. I think there's been some very interesting work done in Scotland where the Scottish Violent Crime Unit have repositioned violence as being more of a health issue than just a law enforcement yeah. issue. Yeah. Health, education, 
local communities, the houses where people live, all of that is important. It's very easy to talk about this as being violent crime and it becomes a policing or law enforcement issue. Well, yes, partly, but mostly it's about all of us. Um, a very important point for me is we as a society have to repudiate violence. We make choices in a civil society to say we're willing to give up some freedoms in return for greater safety and security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was the conclusion of the formal evidence to the Street Weapons Commission in Birmingham. You can join us live this Sunday evening at 7 to hear the conclusions our commission reaches on street weapons. But first, tomorrow night, the truth about street weapons visits its final destination, Glasgow. If you look at what the UN and the WHO are saying, they said that we were the most violent country in Western Europe. Glasgow gang culture probably stems back maybe two, three hundred years, or even perhaps as long as the city's been here. It's one, 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 but again, it's, well, the powers that be, listen, listen, listen.